and Mary, don't you wait on me. Because oh, they were building that railroad that took everything across this great country. Go ahead and marry, don't you wait on me. Well, now, my now, won't you win? I go free, oh, I, my now, won't you win? Uh, I go Professor John Dontremont, and I'm going to read his impressive biography, um, and then invite him to come up and to speak. John will be speaking to you in lecture style, so we have the back, we have the slides uh, screened down, but there will be no projection. It'll be sort of like a uh, an informal lecture, just as you would have if you're going um, to a college lecture. So um, and we'll have a bit of time for Q and A after he speaks as well and I hope that you'll save your questions for that. Over the span of 41 years until his retirement in 2021, John Dontremont taught almost all of the American history courses at randolph macon Women's College, and after its embrace of co-education in 2007, Randolph College. Holder of degrees from the University of Virginia and Johns Hopkins University, Professor Dontremont presented students with the story of America from pre-colonial Native American civilizations to the United States of their own lifetimes. Beyond the classroom, as founding director of the college's American Culture Program, he guided students in travel experiences from Maine to Georgia, from Michigan to Louisiana, and throughout Virginia which he believes is the ultimate laboratory to which to explore all of the major themes in American history. Professor Dontremont's research and writing, as well as his teaching, have focused especially on reform movements, social change, <coughs> and issues of race and gender. His biography of Virginia-born abolitionist, feminist, and radical free thought minister Moncure Conway received the Alan Nevins Prize of the Society of American Historians, the Gustavus Myers Center Award for an outstanding book on the subject of bigotry in the United States, and was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. He has held grants from the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, the Virginia Historical Society, the Virginia Foundation for Independent Colleges, and the Gilder Lehrman Institute, especially in support of his long labor of love and now the foremost focus of his retirement, a history of Virginia from the dinosaurs to the present. So, wonderful to have you with us. I'm gonna welcome John up. We do have John has very kindly presented to us with some recommended reading. And if you didn't get the sheet on your, um, on your seat, we have many copies in the back as you go out. Thank you, and welcome, John. Well, thank you very much. I, I only ask that if you take the reading list, you submit one book report to me a month <laughs> for, for the next 22 months, because there are 22 things on the list. But it's pass-fail, no grades, no pressure. Well, my assignment today is to talk about the origins and development 
uh, and afterlife of American slavery uh, from its beginnings uh, to um, its end and then uh, its afterlife um, of white supremacy and racism all in 45 minutes. Uh, well, uh, I, I don't know, uh, but I, I do take inspiration from Abraham Lincoln who was able to capture the essence and purpose of the United States in five minutes in the Gettysburg Address. So that's the good news, this sort of thing can be done. The bad news is that I'm not Abraham Lincoln, but I will, uh, I will do my best uh, though I warn you, this is going to be a romp. Uh, and uh, just in case I talk so fast you uh, don't know what the heck I'm saying, uh, or I leave something out, uh, I want to make four essential points at the very start before we start our, uh, our uh, Mr. Toad's wild ride uh, through American history. Um, I want to say four things that if you take nothing else away from you today, I'd like you to ponder to consider these four things. The first thing is that slavery is central to American history and to the United States today, even though it hasn't been around since 1865. It's not just another subject among hundreds of others. 20% of Americans were owned by other Americans in 1776, the, uh, the year of independence. Uh, that percentage held when the American Constitution was written and when slavery, without using the name slavery, was embedded in three different ways in the Constitution, as we'll see. Uh, the, um, the beginning of uh, Richard Nixon's memoirs starts out lyrically and wonderfully, uh, I grew up in a house my father built. Michelle Obama, in one of her works and in several of her speeches, uh, it says, lyrically and beautifully and hauntingly, I live in a house built by slaves, referring to uh, the White House. Uh, the uh, the uh, existence of slavery made the American economy. And there are many institutions today from colleges and universities uh, to businesses, uh, to churches, that owe a lot of their prosperity and their wealth to the work done by slaves so many generations ago. It is not just another subject. You cannot understand America or American history without understanding slavery. The second point I would like you to consider is that slavery has a twin sibling. Slavery was started primarily to be the, a, a labor system the solution to the problem of having a continent of overwhelmingly abundant resources and far too little labor to extract those resources and make money from them. American Indians weren't thickly settled enough to make do the labor. Moreover, they were, were able to resist in the way um, that kidnapped Africans could not. Uh, and so they weren't the answer. White indentured servants from England were the temporary answer for most of the 17th century in Virginia and in Maryland, uh, but ultimately they could not be the ultimate answer, uh, in part because by the late 17th century other places like Pennsylvania, which were much healthier climates and were, was run by Quakers who were uh, easier people to live among, uh, when an indentured servant, when a poor person in England decided, I can't stand it in England anymore, there's no hope for me or my kids, I need to go even if it means making myself a temporary slave for six or eight years, indenturing myself to somebody, they go to Pennsylvania instead of Virginia by the late 17th century. And it just became more and more a, a, a difficult, problematic thing in terms of conscience to enslave a fellow Christian. Uh, and so, uh, the Spanish and Portuguese had already paved the way in showing that there were this, 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 this continent full of people you could kidnap and bring over and be permanent slaves. And their kids would be your slaves too. When they had kids, that was more money for you. And so, uh, the transition was made between 1680 and 1730, 1740, uh, in the Chesapeake and in other colonies, to move from white indentured servitude to black slavery. And once it became black slavery, then white supremacy I had took the field. 
white supremacy became as essential to American history as slavery was, because slavery was no longer, by the mid-18th century, just a labor system. It had become also the instrument of racial control. Uh, slaves were a majority, African and African American slaves were a majority of South Carolina from the time of its first census in 1708 until after the Civil War. There were about 45% of the population of Virginia, the most populous colony at the time of the American Revolution. Uh, the, uh, they were about a quarter of the American population period by 1800 and uh, a fifth if you count only those who were enslaved. And uh, white Americans had become accustomed uh, to uh, a certain fact that if you were black, you were inferior. If you were black, you were meant to serve white people. And when slavery died, or to be more precise, when slavery was killed by force in the Civil War, it would have lived much longer in America had it not been killed by force. When slavery was killed, white supremacy was not. One twin died, but the other twin lived on. And that is one of the central legacies of slavery. Another thing I'd like you to consider is that the problem of slavery and racism is not a matter of bad individuals doing cruel things. It is not a matter of personal relationships. It is a matter of a system. It is systemic. Now a lot of people today, some people today, uh, rebel against that word because he, 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 if you say America suffers from a systemic illness, uh, racism, they think you're, you're dissing America. They think you hate America. Well, that's not true. It's just that you want to tell the truth about America and you want to point out something about America that needs uh, to be healed, that needs to stop. I, and you can't heal something unless you recognize it and acknowledge it. There's a lot to love about America, starting with the Declaration of Independence's ideals, starting with the preamble of the Constitution, starting with uh, the civil rights movements that have existed ever since there was the beginning of slavery. I, and the principles of America are, uh, are uh, so um, uh, unimaginably inspirational that we should fight like hell to realize those principles. And realizing those principles will never fully happen unless we acknowledge the serpent in the garden, unless we acknowledge the thing that more than anything else undermines and makes a mockery of those principles. For example, you, you all know that Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, serialized in a magazine in 1851 and uh, published as a book in 1852, was probably the best-selling book other than the Bible of the 19th century. It was a sensation, this critique of slavery by a northern woman who had lived just across the Ohio River on the, from slavery. She lived in Cincinnati where her father was a minister. Uh, and uh, she had visited Kentucky and had seen slavery and had seen fugitives from slavery who had escaped across the river. Harriet Beecher Stowe, when she married and moved to Maine with her husband, who taught at Bowdoin College, uh, sat down when she, at the end of the day when she put her kids to bed and she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was uh, a searing critique of slavery, uh, but it was a critique of slavery, not of Southern white people. In fact, one of the, one of the kindest, nicest people in the book is Augustine St. Clair, who is a... Uh, um, a Lower South uh, cotton planter who owns Uncle Tom. He bought Uncle Tom. Uh, he's the father of little Eva, uh, a, a little girl who's one of the, the most cloying, sugary characters in American literature. And she dies young and she shares with Uncle Tom a pious belief in Jesus. And uh, yet she's just wonderful. And she, she little Eva hates slavery. Uh, but an Augustine St. Clair, inspired by little Eva, tells Tom that he's going to free him. But he doesn't get around to it. 
on the, it's, like, it, it's too convenient to keep Tom on. But he wants to free him. He knows slavery is bad. But one day, Augustine St. Clair is murdered in a, in a barroom brawl that he just gets in the middle of. He's, he's just a bystander. And he's run up some debts, and his wife has to sell people to pay his debts. Happened all the time, all the time in slavery. People die in debt, and their spouse has to sell people to, uh, to uh, keep the creditors from the door. It happened to James Madison, to Dolly Madison, when James Madison died. She sold a lot of people and, and, and the plantation at Montpelier to pay his debts. And the people who were weeping when they followed James Madison's coffin to the grave were not weeping, as some white people thought, because they loved James Madison so much. They were weeping because they knew their families were about to be broken up. It was the system, Harriet Beecher said, that was the problem. She made the villain of Uncle Tom's Cabin, Simon Legree, a native of Vermont. He was a Yankee who had come down south. Uh, he was the, uh, the worst creature you could imagine. She didn't hate Southerners, she hated slavery. It was the system, not the people. And what that means is that um, if, if uh, a white person today has a, a black person in the family, or has a black friend, black coworker, and uh, they want to say, I don't see race, they're very sincere about that. You're going to believe them up to a point in a way. But if one, uh, too often when one says that, what one is really saying is, um, uh, uh, when you say, I don't see color, what you're really saying is you don't think that race is that big a problem. Uh, and uh, you don't see the system that is the problem rather than whether someone's nice to someone else or not. <clears throat> the final thing is that the essence of slavery itself, as well as the essential prop that kept it going, was always violence. It could not have lasted a day without violence and the constant threat of violence. Violence against the body, the mind, the heart, the soul, the gender, the autonomy, the dignity of someone. And therefore, unimaginable cruelty was the essence of slavery. Uh, what do I mean by gender? Well, for example, a father in slavery was not the ultimate arbiter of how his children were raised. He was not the ultimate disciplinarian of his children. Uh, he uh, was not the head of his family. He wasn't permitted to be. His marriage was not even recognized under the law. Why not? Because the law had to make it uh, 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 easy to sell people apart from each other, if that was in the financial interest of the seller. Uh, children were not the, the, uh, uh, under the aegis of the parents. They were owned by the owner, by the plantation person, or whoever owned these people. You could not be a father. Your kids could be sold today without your knowledge, without your consultation. Uh, to be a, a woman in slavery, you could never be a lady. That was laughable. Uh, to be a woman, well, you know, with, the word woman wasn't used that very often by uh, white people in slave societies. By the 18th century, the word wench had come to be mostly reserved for black women. They were wenches. And a black woman in slavery, whether she was eight years old or 18 or 78, a black woman was constantly living under the fear of assault. Harriet Jacobs, who wrote the most important autobiography by an enslaved woman or a formerly enslaved woman, said that slavery is terrible for everyone, but it is especially terrible for a woman. So the, in, in, a, in a generation or generations in which gender was an absolutely central part of one's being, perhaps even more than it is now, um, in an age when we're expanding the notion of gender, uh, not to be allowed to be a woman, to be able to take care of your kids, <clears throat> to, uh, to work within the home, instead of being forced to, to do hard physical labor day after day, six days a week, uh, while 
on your, your young children were in the care of old people who had uh, worked beyond their ability to work the fields anymore. You barely see your own kids. To have to, if you were a house slave, to have to take care of the owner's kids during the day and see them way more than you see your own kids. That is an insult to you as a woman. And so the, and these are, this is violence. This is violence against a person's identity. It's psychic violence, which is just as searing, if not more so, than physical violence. Now, it, this is important for two reasons. One, that, that we underestimate the enormity of slavery if we underestimate the continual violence and threat of violence of the institution. But it's important also because it is, while it's the essence of slavery, it's also the essence of slavery's vulnerability. Because it was exposing the violence of slavery, which abolitionists, black and white, did for decades, that raised the consciousness and pricked the conscience of increasing numbers of Americans in the 19th century. Uh, it's partly the influence of the 18th century enlightenment. You know, if you were riding down a country lane in, say, 1700, and you came upon a, person, um, a person's head on a post, you might say, uh, oh, God's will be done. But increasingly, if you were riding down a country lane in um, 1850, and you saw somebody's body parts spread out all over the road, some people would still say, oh, well, it must have deserved it, but more and more people would have said, what villain has done this? A, a, a being decent, being not cruel to other people was part of the essence of the Enlightenment. And increasingly, even those who owned slaves were aware of its cruelty, and some were genuinely troubled by it. The, uh, the opposition to slavery probably would never have happened if it weren't for the publicity of its violence. More than that, though, it provides us a way of realizing that ending racism is not just a pipe dream. It's not going to be ended in the lifetime of anyone walking on Earth today. I firmly believe that. It can't be. But it, we, can, we can move it further toward obliteration if we keep aware of and exposing the violence and cruelty of racism, of white supremacy. Not just when people riot and kill people, but just the day-to-day, -day, the day-to-day -day cruelty of feeling that one group of people, because of their ethnicity, is superior to another. I found in my years of teaching that you could get people to pay attention you could get people to think about something if you first approached their conscience. And then, once you had engaged their conscience, then you could engage their minds. Uh, I, 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 it, it was true almost every time. Now, here we go. The romp. <clears throat> Americans didn't invent slavery, certainly. Slavery existed for countless thousands of years before uh, Columbus sailed in the 1490s. And the British did not invent slavery either. Uh, the transatlantic slave trade was pioneered by the Portuguese, a seafaring nation, uh, the first people to thoroughly explore the African coast and map the African coast. The Portuguese uh, took over the island of Madeira just west of, the, uh, west of Morocco in east, the eastern Atlantic. And that's where uh, modern sugar cultivation in the Western world began. The Portuguese needed labor to work the sugar fields of Madeira, and so they bargained with uh, African leaders on the, on the northwest coast of Africa who raided in the interior and brought them people to enslave. Slavery took root in Madeira. The Portuguese made a lot of money from sugar cultivation and discovered uh, that products that addict people are the most lucrative products. I, and I, so people became addicted to sugar. Even very poor people to spruce up a bland diet would save their money to buy a little bit of sugar to uh, put in their otherwise un, uh, unpalatable uh, diet. And of course, what followed sugar was tobacco uh, and 
chocolate and coffee, uh, all things that continue to addict people all over the world, including us. The Portuguese pioneered this. And then Columbus, so that's about 1450. When Columbus gets around to uh, bumping into the Bahamas and Hispaniola and elsewhere on the, in the Western Hemisphere in the 1490s, African slavery has already been established in the Eastern Atlantic. And it's just a, a small step for the Portuguese to load up slave ships and bring them all the way across the Atlantic uh, and populate the Caribbean islands, which were also perfect for growing sugar, uh, as well as other crops. So the Portuguese dominate the trade in the 16th century. Uh, then along come the Dutch in the 17th century. Uh, the Dutch have not, not too long before uh, gotten their independence. They're a rising Protestant nation uh, in a sea of Catholic nations. Uh, they're uh, proud of their, uh, their economic uh, weight. They punch way above their weight in the world. Uh, and slavery is the key to all of this. This is what used to be called the golden age, even 10 years ago. If you, like, you go to Amsterdam, the Rijksmuseum was talking about the Dutch golden age. Now all of that has come down. You don't see people talking about, officially talking about the golden age anymore because that was based in slavery. Uh, so the Dutch dominate the 17th century. The British, though, take over in the 18th. The Royal African Company is founded in the 1660s and starts really doing its work in the 1670s. The British monarchy is heavily invested in that. The Duke of York is an officer in the Royal, uh, uh, the uh, Royal African Company. He would become James II. And for a time in the late 17th century, every slave kidnapped in Africa and brought over by the Royal African Company to places like Jamaica and Barbados is branded with the initials DY for Duke of York. And the, uh, the British transatlantic slave trade was, if anything, more specialized and more intensive than the slave trades that had gone before. Specialized slave ships were uh, created so that if you were uh, sighting through your, uh, through your binoculars or your telescope, you're um, sighting another ship on the horizon, you could tell from a distance if it was a slave ship. You could tell because it had netting all around the perimeter hanging out off of the ship. Why? Because it was not unusual for enslaved people when they come up and they're allowed to come up on deck to exercise for them to throw themselves over the side, either in despair or in defiance, uh, but just to either end it all or to cheat the uh, kidnappers out of their money. And so now they can't jump overboard anymore because they'll hit the net. That's one way to tell a slave ship. Another way is you can see that there is a special deck at the stern of the ship uh, that looks different from any other ship's stern that has cannon, one or sometimes two cannon, facing not outward toward, uh, uh, toward another ship, an enemy ship, but rather facing uh, inward toward the main deck of the slave ship itself. And this is uh, so that if there's a rebellion on board, uh, the crew can take refuge in the stern on that special deck and fire their cannon into the charging uh, on African uh, rebels. Uh, the, uh, the, the slave trade in all, from 1450 to about 1850, when uh, the shipments to Brazil stop, uh, about 12 and a half million people are taken away from Africa and brought to the Western Hemisphere. Of those, about 10.7 million survived the journey. So about 1.8 million people died on the way from Africa to the Western Hemisphere in that 400 year uh, period. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, uh, it's, on your, it's on your reading list. There is a, a, an actual database uh, that has been done in the last 20 years or so, headed by David Eltis, who's a historian at Emory University. Uh, and it has done amazing work in uh, compiling records of every known slave ship voyage uh, during the existence of the transatlantic slave trade. So the statistics that I've just given you are far more reliable than anything that, has, uh, that had gone before, anything that I was taught uh, when I was in graduate school.
Now, we fast forward to the American Revolution, which of course is all about liberty and, uh, and the rejection of British efforts to enslave the colonists. In the 1760s and 70s, it's really striking how the so-called patriots use slavery imagery constantly, including patriots like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, uh, who owned hundreds of slaves. Thomas Jefferson owned over 600 slaves uh, in his lifetime. Uh, constantly, uh, whether one owned slaves or not, uh, the, the, it was hard to go through the 1760s without using that imagery. John Adams, who never, never owned a, a person, John Adams in 1765, opposing the Stamp Act, said, we won't be their Negroes. We won't be the Negroes of the British government. John Dickinson of Pennsylvania, who did own slaves, said in the same year, we are taxed without our own consent, therefore we are slaves. And Patrick Henry, in his most famous uh, speech in 1775, said famously, is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. I did that better when I did the speech in, a eighth, in an eighth grade speech contest in Lynn, Massachusetts. But I was the runner up then, so it wasn't <laughs> Anyway, so Patrick Henry is saying that the, the choice is between the chains of slavery or independence from Britain. Now, of course, that's pretty over the top. Uh, and I mean, people then knew it was over the top, but they said these things anyway. Most famously, Samuel Johnson, the, the British wit, coffee house hanger outer, and uh, compiler of dictionary, Samuel Johnson in 1774 said, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes? Uh, and that uh, kind of got to the heart of the matter. But he wa it wasn't just British royalist critics of the American patriots who said that sort of thing. Some of them said it themselves. Benjamin Rush, signer of the Declaration of Independence, a friend of Thomas Jefferson, Philadelphian who was considered America's most distinguished physician, Benjamin Rush said in 1773, we cannot reconcile the exercise of slavery with our professions of freedom. Abigail Adams, just before the fighting started in the revolution, said, it always appears a most iniquitous scheme to me, fight ourselves for what we are daily robbing and plundering from those who have as good a right to freedom as we have. And a very famous at the time, Congregationalist minister Samuel Hopkins said in 75, enslaved people look on and hear the sons of liberty oppressing and tyrannizing thousands of poor blacks who have as good a claim to liberty as themselves. I am shocked with the glaring inconsistency. In a way, Patrick Henry, in a letter he wrote to a Quaker friend after the revolution, comes across as the most refreshing of people because a Quaker friend said to him, Mr. Henry, you are the most popular person in Virginia. And that was true at the time. He said that if you freed your slaves, and I know you know it's wrong, slavery's wrong, if you free your slaves, what an example you would set for others and for the future of this new country. And Henry wrote back and he said, I paraphrase, but he said, you're right, slavery is terrible. And I understand your point. I am well liked and people look up to me and, and uh, you're right, I probably should do that, but I'm not going to, I'm not gonna free anybody. And this is not paraphrase, this is what he said. He said, because of the inconvenience of doing without them. And that expresses the, the feelings of so many, not only then, but off into the 19th century uh, yeah, it, it's wrong, but uh, I don't know these people very well that I enslave, and uh, I don't really grieve that much uh, when they leave, whether they die or sell them off. Uh, and boy, it sure helps me. I, it's inconvenient to do without them. And before we are, are too quick to condemn, I think in, certainly on a lesser scale, but there are all sorts of things that we close our minds to or refuse to really see. There's so much, uh, so much in the world that's unpleasant. We 
We don't want to grapple with it. It's inconvenient uh, to grapple with truth sometimes. Uh, yeah, and it's unpleasant. And, and Henry had, the, had the, uh, the candor to admit it. Well, uh, the revolution happens, the fighting starts, and uh, you know, the, the enslaved people themselves are very aware of this contradiction between yelps for liberty and holding on to slavery. Uh, and uh, I, I, I remember at the very start of the fighting, there's a torchlight parade through Charleston. And the Sons of Liberty are marching, and men are signing up for the army, uh, and they're all excited about fighting for their liberty, and they're, they're shouting, liberty, 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 as they march through Charleston. <coughs> and Henry Lawrence, who was one of the richest people in the colonies, big slave owner, uh, and a uh, very faithful patriot, he's watching this, and he notices that there are a, a, a group of enslaved people, a few doors down, who are uh, watching the parade, and they're yelling, liberty, 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 also. And Lawrence writes, um, there's some danger ahead, because uh, the people we enslave are um, imbibing the language of the Enlightenment and the language of liberty. What's going to happen to us if they start carrying it out? Well, people like Lawrence on the Patriot side were not the only ones thinking about this, but the British were too. And the British understood that uh, a, a young enslaved black man might make a good ally. And so it was that the last royal governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, in November of 1775, issued a proclamation saying that any enslaved person who is enslaved by a rebel, who gets to British lines and is willing to work for the British army, or to join the British army, uh, will be immediately freed. Uh, and hundreds get to his lines, or get to his ship when he takes to a ship uh, when it's too uh, dangerous for him to be on the land anymore. Hundreds reach him, and doubtless many, 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 many more try to reach him, or would have reached him if they had been able to get away. Uh, the news of Dunmore's proclamation spread throughout the colonies and across the Atlantic with amazing speed. I, and uh, other enslaved people in other colonies fighting for independence, uh, even though they, hadn't ha they weren't under similar proclamations, they fled to the British as well. I, and I, some people up in Boston, or the siege of Boston, George Washington was in Cambridge besieging Boston at the time, went to Washington and said, we've got to put blacks in our army too, or else uh, they'll all go over to the British. Uh, now, already, some uh, African-Americans in Massachusetts had joined the siege of Boston on the American side, free, uh, and uh, mostly free black people had joined, and a few slaves were permitted to join as well. And Washington said, no, no way. Uh, in fact, am, am I not, not only not going to expand the black presence in the army, I'm going to officially ban any black people from joining the army, and I want you to weed out all the black people who are already there. This is dangerous. And if we keep doing this, then black people will expect our fight for our liberty to be a fight for their liberty too, and it's not. They are outside the social compact. They are not part of the deal. Uh, well, uh, the officers said, look, we can't kick out people who are already here. We need them. And, this would be terrible publicity uh, among the black population. He ultimately relented. But the fact is that during the course of the American Revolutionary War, the British did free thousands of American <coughs> enslaved men and women. Dunmore's proclamation had said anything about women, but women ran to his lines too, and children, people with children, and he did not send them back. Uh, so the, the fact is, that more African Americans in the fight for American freedom and independence fought on the British side and went over to the British side than served in any capacity on the American side. Add that to your ironies of American, uh, American history. And the escapees included many uh, slaves of prominent revolutionaries, including Harry Washington from Mount Vernon, uh, another guy named Daniel Payne, uh, who escaped from George Washington. 
uh, and was in New York uh, on, during the Br long British occupation when the last British ship at the end of the revolution left New York to go to Canada, the last British presence on American soil, Daniel Payne was on the stern of that ship looking out at the fireworks uh, that were being sent up uh, at the battery in New York City as George Washington and his entourage entered the city. His former owner, George Washington, entering the city amid fireworks while he sails away to his freedom in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And during the War of 1812, the British sailed up and down uh, the Chesapeake Bay, uh, getting hundreds and ultimately about 3,000 uh, enslaved Marylanders and Virginians to come to uh, British ships and get away and get their freedom. The British had a base on Tangier Island from which they sent raiding parties to try to uh, emancipate American slaves. One of those slaves in the War of 1812 uh, arranged to get 17 other people to escape with him in small boats and get to a British ship which took them to freedom on Tangier Island and ultimately Nova Scotia. And this guy, Bartlett Shanklin, a blacksmith, wrote to his owner from Halifax about a year later. He said, sir, I take this opportunity of writing these lines to inform you how I am situated here. I have a shop and a set of tools of my own and I am doing very well. When I was with you, you treated me very ill. For that reason, I take the liberty of informing you that I am doing as well as you, if not better. <laughs> when I was with you, I worked very hard and you neither gave me money nor any satisfaction. But since I have been here, I am able to make gold and silver as well as you. The night that your overseer stopped me, he was very strong, but I showed him that subtlety was far preferable to strength. That is, he gave the overseer song and dance excuse about why he was out at night, and the overseer accepted, and he, he got to the small boats and got away. Uh, but I showed him that subtlety was preferably to strength and brought away others with me who, thank God, are all doing well. Sir, I remain Bartlett Shanklin free. Now, at the end of the, uh, of the war, uh, Americans were mostly realized that something had to be done about slavery. There was an, an acknowledgement of the contradiction in all of this. And in the North, which one historian, Ira Berlin, has described as societies with slaves, societies that weren't based in slavery but had slaves, in the Northern colonies, emancipation, true emancipation of all slaves took place either immediately, as in Massachusetts, uh, or gradually, as in Pennsylvania or, or uh, New Jersey or New York. But total emancipation, whether immediate or gradual, was the result of the revolution in the North. But from Maryland South, which Berlin describes as slave societies, societies that are fully embracing slavery, and slavery is crucial to their economies and their social system. In those places, well, the best they could do was expanding manumission laws, that is, allowing individual slave owners greater freedom to free individual slaves if they wanted to. I, in Virginia in 1786, such a manumission law was passed saying that you could free any slaves you wanted to uh, without having to get government permission, permission of the General Assembly. And that produced about 10,000 free black people in Virginia uh, in the, over the next 15 years or so. It finally was completely repealed in 1806, uh, and a new law was set up saying, there are too many free blacks here, we don't want any more, and so to guard against too many free black people putting ideas in the heads of our slaves, you can still free slaves, but you have to pay to remove them from the state within one year. That was much more liberal than anything done in the Deep South. In the Deep South, basically nothing uh, was done uh, uh, to realize the Enlightenment. Now after this, you know the story. After this, the combination of the Louisiana Purchase and the Indian removal uh, under President Jackson in the 1830s opens up what to them was the West. Uh, for settlement and money making. And of course, this was cotton country, most of it. And so cotton, even more than tobacco and sugar, became the most important and lucrative commodity in the world economy, not just the American economy, the world economy. 
some new cotton planters, now that the Indians were removed to Oklahoma, uh, and uh, now that America owned all of this land, just there for the taking, cotton planters generally could get banks to extend credit, incredible amounts of credit, uh, with which to buy land and buy people, as cotton would probably bring the planter uh, a, huge, uh, a huge income, more than enough cash to pay the creditors back with interest. And if it didn't, well, the bank could always take over the land, foreclose, and take the people too. So it was a good deal for banks. It was a great deal for insurance companies, which made huge profits in insuring uh, land and slaves. I, and I, I, a huge deal for manufacturing companies in the north, textile factories, which took all of this cotton and turned it into cloth and sent it all around the world. And the point is, is that antebellum slavery, once the United States is free to have a slave-based economy, uh, ante antebellum slavery made America rich. It didn't make most Americans rich, it made America rich. Uh, you, you've read and heard that Lynchburg was the second richest city in America, second only to New Bedford, in the years before the Civil War. Well, okay, but what's that, what that is really saying uh, is that the accumulated wealth of Lynchburg per capita uh, was uh, the greatest, second only to New Bedford. But you're not talking about, it, uh, about black people. You're not talking about the black people who were nearly half the population of Lynchburg. If you let them, if you leave them out of the picture, uh, then Lynchburg wasn't anywhere near the second wealthiest city in America. But white people who profited from slavery were doing very well. Wherever you look in antebellum America, you see involvement with slavery, not just in the South. Remember, it's systemic. It's not just bad people doing bad things. Brown University was endowed with slave trade money. Georgetown University, when it got into fiscal trouble, in the antebellum years, sold over 200 people, sold the slaves that it had in order to save the university. And it's just now trying to make amends among the descendants, if they can be found, of the people that it sold. UVA, uh, UVA um, uh, allowed uh, all students to bring slaves with them. It allowed uh, the, um, the owners of the pavilions where the, the, the um, food service was to have their own slaves. There were slaves rented by the university to clean the students' rooms, uh, to take care of the stables, etc., etc. When I went to UVA in the 1960s, late 1960s, I, I, I knew about slavery. I had some vague sense that slavery had been around then, but I had no idea that it pervaded the university. Uh, when you go to UVA and explore the, the back gardens behind the lawn rooms and the pavilions that are interspersed among the student rooms, these nice gardens that were created by the Garden Club in the 1950s. What they don't tell you until now, until the last five years or so, is that those were filled with outbuildings and that's where slaves lived and worked, uh, taking care of the students and the professors and the other white workers on the lawn. Uh, so, uh, so, and, and of course Lowell, Massachusetts, a show place. Charles Dickens visited there when he visited America. Uh, a, a show place where young women could come from all over New England and work the looms and create some of the best cloth in the world. All of the raw materials they worked with came from slave labor. Uh, even consumer items. It was hard to be a consumer, even an anti-slavery one, and not buy something that slaves had touched that slaves had produced. Lydia Maria Child, leading abolitionist, tried to grow sugar beets along with her husband so that they wouldn't have to buy sugar made with slave-grown sugar cane. It was a failure, but bless her heart, for trying. But slave property by 1860 was worth three and a half billion dollars in 1860 dollars. And then about a thousand dollars then would be about thirty-five thousand dollars now. So do the math, three and a half billion dollars in 1860. Uh, dollars and uh, uh, slave property was valued at a higher rate, uh, at a higher number than all the real estate in the 15 slave states combined and exceeded American investment in banks and railroads and manufacturing combined. And cotton culture was so lucrative that, uh, that slaves were pressured to work faster and produce more each decade 
from 1810 to 1860. How'd they do it? They didn't do it with mechanization. Cotton was not really mechanized until the 20th century. So how did they do it? Well, instead of picking cotton with one hand, holding the basket here and picking cotton with one hand, uh, you had to put the basket down and pick cotton with two hands by the 1840s, as fast as you could, two hands. And uh, you had a quota. You'd have to go up and have your basket weighed. Uh, and if the basket was short, you'd be whipped. This was standard practice on a cotton plantation. And a cotton plantation was far more humane than a sugar plantation. Louisiana was full of sugar plantations, and Louisiana was the only state, the only state with slaves, in which the slave population did not naturally increase. The slave population of Louisiana decreased, despite constant new purchases from the northern part of the South. It decreased, and the slave couples could not maintain the population, so killing were the sugar fields of Louisiana. And then the internal slave trade, of course, is booming to feed these states in the Cotton South. One million people were sold from the Upper South to the Lower South between 1820 and 1860, and another two million were sold within states. It was impossible to be a slave in the 19th century without knowing somebody who was sold or without being sold yourself, often several times. Slavery was a business existing for profit, and every slave, without exception, had a particular market value. Um, going all the way down to zero, if you were old and couldn't work, you were listed on, uh, on the records as zero, and usually you were just put out in a cabin somewhere, and you were expected to be maintained by the other enslaved people. But usually most owners had nothing to do with you because you could not produce anymore. This interstate slave trade was remarkably sophisticated, took advantage of the latest in transportation, communication, they owned their own steamboats, closely watched the market fluctuations, had complex networks of contacts, adopted accounting practices that were state of the art, sorted out their merchandise into categories. If you were looking for a, a sex partner, then uh, you scanned the ads looking for a likely young yellow girl. Yellow was a code word very often for light-skinned and someone who was probably pretty. Seamstress was often a code word for someone if you were looking for someone to, uh, to have sex with on a regular basis. Seamstress, that meant she wasn't cut out for field work, which most women did. Uh, she was somebody who you'd have in the house. She might be able to sew and make clothing, uh, but uh, it was code and people understood this. Slave traders themselves, who became extremely wealthy, slave traders themselves almost always had uh, slave mistresses or concubines or rapies. Uh, Robert Lumpkin, whose slave jail is being excavated now in Richmond, uh, had an enslaved woman named Mary whom he bought at the age of 12, and she bore the first of seven children she had with him when she was 13. Uh, interestingly, though, when slavery ended in 1865, and he was still in business, uh, he, uh, he freed her in his will. He died the year after the Civil War and freed her. He described her in his will as the woman who lives with me. And he freed her and her children. I, there, I, I know that I'm past my, my time here. I, I, and so I will just summarize on what I want to tell you. And that is that the the cruelty of all of this became so apparent and so unmistakable and so uh, damaging in uh, making America uh, a, um, a, a lesser thing in the eyes of the civilized Western world, since most of Europe was moving toward uh, abolition. Britain abolished slavery in its empire in the 1830s, for example. And whatever Britain did, well, uh, America paid attention to. Uh, that there grew up in America a political party, the Republicans, uh, that said, okay, slavery, um, we, we can't do away with it because the Constitution prohibits that, but we can stop it from spreading. Abraham Lincoln was uh, the standard bearer of that party in 1860, the first Republican to be elected president. Uh, yet the fact that now slavery would not be able to spread to the Western territories and to any other new territories was what made Southern states leave the Union to protect slavery. 
and to protect white supremacy. And this, you can look on the internet and find the ordinances of secession by southern states, and you will see that this is stated very explicitly. This is why they're seceding. It's not about the tariff, it's about slavery. Alexander Stevens, in a speech given in Savannah in March of 1861, just three weeks before Fort Sumter, summed it up when he said, our new government is founded on the opposite idea of what Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. The opposite idea. Its foundations are laid, the cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery is his natural and normal condition. This new government is the first in the history of the world that is based upon this physical, philosophical, and moral truth. Uh, well, the irony was that in, the, in uh, leaving the country in order to protect slavery, uh, what the uh, slaveholders did was they brought slavery tumbling down on their heads. I think slavery would have lasted at least until the end of World War I and pro po quite possibly the end of World War II in America. Uh, it was so profitable and mechanization of the chiefs uh, uh, crops that slaves grew was so slow in coming. I can't prove that, but that's my hunch. Uh, but it ended in 1865 uh, because of uh, the precipitation of a war by the slaveholders themselves. But white supremacy did not end. Reconstruction was a brief effort by uh, Republicans in the Congress to make America's government consistent with America's stated principles. The 13th Amendment ending slavery, and then in 68 and 1870, the 14th and 15th Amendments, providing for birthright citizenship, making black people citizens, uh, and giving black men the vote in 1870. But a combination of two things wrecked Reconstruction. Uh, northern white fatigue, northern whites just got sick of the race issue and making southerners be good and gave up trying to enforce civil rights in the South. And why did they do that? Because Southern whites resisted violently every day. The Ku Klux Klan was just the most famous of several paramilitary groups, the Knights of the White Camellia, they were all over the place. And the horrors that these people visited upon black people or their white allies who attempted to live in a new world of civil rights and real freedom for everybody the horrors they visited on them were unimaginable. I think of one instance that's in one of the books that I have on the reading list. Uh, one instance in Georgia where night riders descended upon a, a, a simple little cabin where a black family lived. Uh, they dragged the man out of the house. When you heard the, the horse's hooves coming, you knew it was terrible. You were terrified because most black people couldn't afford all these horses. Uh, so the black guy is, is, is taken from his house, he's castrated, he's stripped and he's castrated. He's told by the people with masks on, uh, next time we'll kill you unless you leave, you leave the area, you move away. So he staggers naked into the little town, he knocks on doors, nobody will help him. Uh, he, uh, he uh, finally, he knocks on a doctor's door that he knows, a white doctor, and the doctor's not in goes to other houses, both black and white people, and black people are afraid to help him, the white people won't help him. Finally, he collapses and somebody helps him. Somebody picks up his, his unconscious body and helps him to a bed, uh, and miraculously, he does recover, and he finds out that the reason the doctor wasn't in when he knocked on the doctor's door is the doctor was participating in the raid, uh, had a, a mask on, uh, and the guy did leave. Uh, he, he moved away, as his family did. This is what you had to deal with uh, if you wanted to take the 14th and 15th Amendment seriously, if you dared to vote, uh, and uh, if Democrats, white conservatives, had taken over the government of your state. By 1877, Reconstruction is totally over in the entire South. Now, interestingly, in Virginia, there was a, uh, there was a brief but amazing political movement, a biracial movement, I uh, call the Readjusters. The Readjusters were a biracial coalition united to advance public education for poor whites and poor blacks. They found common ground on that issue. They elected black legislators. They elected a white Readjuster governor in 1881. Lynchburg had five black city councilors in the 1880s. 
uh, out of a total of 15 sitting on the council at any one time. So they never had a majority, but they were able to unite with readjuster whites uh, yet to build schools for black people in Lynchburg in the 1880s. But what happened was what has happened constantly in American history. That is, demagogues came along to say, what are you doing uniting with black people? Black people are, uh, are barbarians. They're going to turn on you. At any time, you need to side with your own people, white people. Uh, yeah, black people don't know enough to give way on the sidewalk. They dress in an uppity way. Uh, look at the people you're allied with. And it worked. It's worked every time in American history. Until finally, in 1902, Virginians got together uh, and wrote a new constitution to replace the more progressive um, the Reconstruction Constitution and formally disfranchised black people by imposing a temporary literacy, literacy test, which would be imposed uh, at registration by a white clerk, and a poll tax, which had to be paid three years in advance. This disfranchised over 95% of black voters in Virginia. It made that much of a difference between the election of 1900 and the election of 1904. 95%. That's, that was its intention, to get rid of, as John Daniel of Lynchburg, uh, the head of the, the uh, Committee on the Elective Franchise of the convention said, to get rid of a putrid electorate, uh, to uh, get rid of the, the reconstruction and readjuster arrangements where black people had a political voice. Now in the process, because poor whites were affected by the poll tax too, it disfranchised about 50% of Virginia whites. But as Daniel said in his closing speech, the Anglo-Saxon will gladly accept tyranny than to give up uh, anything to a putrid electorate. They'll gladly accept tyranny. And it occurs to me that even now there are white people who will give up democracy if they can see black people not advancing. Um, you know, these things, my grandmother was alive in 1902 when blacks and poor whites were disfranchised in Virginia. I knew her very well. I was 22 when she died. This wasn't that long ago. And if you want to know why our present predicaments are going on, well, why wouldn't they be going on? It's a direct line to what has happened before. Uh, Laura Town, a Philadelphian who went to work among the freedmen in the Sea Islands of South Carolina in 18, uh, 1861, after it, they'd been occupied by the Union Navy, and she lived there until she died in 1901. Laura Town, seeing the collapse of Reconstruction, seeing the disfranchisement of the 1890s and the lynchings and the Jim Crow, she wrote, revolutions can go backward. Revolutions can go backward. And uh, we need to all think about that. Now we will close, and I'm sorry for, for uh, keeping you, but I will close by recommending another book to you that's not on the list. Uh, it's um, by a woman named Heather McGee, and it's called The Sum of Us, S-U-M, The Sum of Us. It to me is a, a very moving and helpful book because it's about our present predicament and how the the racial gap can be closed and how white and black people can unite around common goals without being constantly sabotaged uh, by demagogues. She uses the metaphor of a swimming pool and she says that uh, all around America in the 1950s and 1960s in, as integration was coming in and being resisted that <coughs> municipal swimming pools like the one over here in Riverside Park, uh, municipal swimming pools were being drained rather than permit black people to swim in them along with whites, so that white people couldn't use the swimming pools either. They did that in Lynchburg. And she says that very often that's what happens, that white people support political candidates and parties and, and um, uh, acts of, of the legislature and city councils that are directly opposite to what their interests are. And they do it because the people doing these things are, seem to hate the same people they do. When in fact, there's no particular reason for them to hate those people, they're just being told constantly those people are bad and we ought to hate them. And so if we can neutralize those people, they'll accept any withdrawal of their own rights, as long as those people are put in their place. And um, she offers some, some tips, 
uh, on, on how to get out of this. And one of them uh, is what I have found to be useful for many years now in talking to people about the Confederacy, uh, and that is to, to never be self-righteous, to be always on the side of, of kindness, kindness is better than cruelty, to try to uh, I I explain to people who will listen the cruelty of something, uh, and uh, try to prick their conscience, uh, and uh, then to, uh, to try to admit and acknowledge that you're not, a, uh, we're not a perfect people either. Uh, we don't have all the answers. We're, we, don't, we do terrible things sometimes, that we, sometimes we wince at them, and sometimes we go on not realizing how bad that was, that thing we did. That we all have to work on ourselves. We all fall short of the glory of God. And if one comes at this with that kind of humility, if one, for example, talking about the Confederacy, one fully acknowledges the truth, which is the North did not fight to free the slaves, not for the first two years of the war. All it fought, was to, fought for was to save the Union. The Union as it was. The Congress passed a resolution in 1861, the first few months of the war, saying that the war wasn't about slavery, it was about saving the Union as it was. Lincoln, a month before the war started, said in his first inaugural, I will enforce all the laws, including the Fugitive Slave Act. So I, I think that defenders of the Confederacy defend it because they think people who are talking about how bad the Confederacy was are righteously saying the Yankees were pure and the, the Southerners were terrible. Well, if you tell the truth, everybody had blood on their hands. And it was only because in the middle of the war, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued in order to undermine the economy of the enemy, uh, rather than to do a great moral act, even though Lincoln did think it was a great moral act. So if you tell the truth, the truth about yourself, as well as about those you are criticizing, and you find common ground, Therefore, about A, wanting to be kind and not cruel, and B, realizing how we all have feet of clay, we all have things to be sorry for, then you can start to have a conversation about the cost of white supremacy and the payments we make for slavery. When two young uppity black men are expelled from the Tennessee legislature, that's a payment for slavery. When a 16-year-old black kid rings on the wrong doorbell and he gets shot twice by the, the white man in, in the house, that's a payment for slavery. When Jill Biden says the all-black LSU women's basketball championship team coming to the White House, that's great. Why don't we have the runner-up, the almost all-white Iowa team come to and share the spotlight? She meant well, uh, but people are going to take that because of American history uh, as an insult, as a kind of semi-racist thing. That's a payment for slavery. When a person in a biracial conversation feels awkward and, and wants to edit themselves about what they say, that's a payment for slavery. But the past is a burden, but it's not a prison. And if we are conscious of these things and face facts and uh, find common ground around kindness, we can move the ball toward a day after we're all on the ground. It won't happen in our time, but we can do our part to, as Thomas Paine said and Ronald Reagan repeated all the time, to make the world over new. Thank you very much. It's an honor to speak. Now, I warned you I was not Abraham Lincoln. So uh, I, I, I could have gotten many Gettysburg addresses in this, but I understand you have to leave, but I'll, I'll be glad to entertain a couple of questions if you have them. Or comments. Okay, well it's supper time. Thank you. see everybody back in May for our final lecture in the series uh, this year. Please help yourself to something to eat or drink, um, and if you didn't catch the reading list, it is on the table in the back. Thank you all so much for coming. Took everything across this great country. <laughs>
Go ahead and marry, don't you? Wait on me, well now. Might not want you when I go free, oh I. Might not want you when uh, I go free.